Hi, everyone. My name is Stacy Lee. I'm an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School, where I teach health law, business law, and negotiations. And today in this live stream lecture, we're going to delve into some negotiation frameworks. We're going to explore strategies, tips, and approaches to negotiations. And now clearly in an hour, it is impossible to go through all of the strategies and approaches for effective negotiation, or as I like to say, effective understanding approaches. So if you like what you hear and you'd like to delve deeper into negotiation frameworks, we will be having a four part course where we look at negotiation approaches, strategies, and how to plan for negotiations, both in your professional and your personal lives. Now, for the next hour, I'd like for this to be an interactive session. So if you have questions or specific negotiation challenges that you're dealing with, please feel free to put them in the chat. Rather than waiting until the end of this session to deal with your questions, if I can incorporate them and highlight specific areas, I'd like to do that in real time. So let's get started. For our session today, I'd like to explore why negotiation. Of all the topics that they could have featured in a live stream session, why at this particular time in history with what's going on right now, why are refining your negotiation skills time well spent? I'd like for us to delve briefly into negotiation frameworks. We will look at what are approaches and guiding principles to help us organize the myriad of strategies and different negotiation approaches. And as I said, I'd like for this to be an interactive session. And for that to be the case, we need to put negotiation in practice. So I'd like to reserve some time to talk about what are current challenges that you're facing that require negotiation nuanced skills and approaches. Because at the end of the day, the goal of all negotiations are to create doable and durable agreements. So how do we begin to do that? What are the strategies? What are the approaches? How do you plan so you can do that? Now, with that preview, let's delve into why we negotiate. So again, why have a session on negotiation? Given what's going on at this particular time, I think there's no better setting to take an hour out of your day to figure out how do you communicate more effectively and adding on to that, how do you negotiate more effectively? The interesting thing about negotiations is that we all do it. The goal, however, is to do it mindfully and not reflexively. Not only do we all do negotiation, we do it in our personal and in our professional lives. And what makes what's going on right now so interesting or so challenging is that for the first time in history or recent history, these two spheres are personal and our professional lives are combined in an unprecedented way. For the past several weeks, many of us are running our careers out of our house. So conversations with colleagues, conversations with staff, with bosses, those conversations that would take place in a professional setting are now taking place in your apartment or in your home. So that adds an added layer of complexity, but the strategies, the approaches for effective communication in our professional life require certain skills. In our personal lives, those negotiations of what I consider second shift responsibilities, you know, all that stuff you have to do once you get done with your job, who picks up the laundry, who does the groceries, if you're like me right now, how do you negotiate getting your kid to do the mountain of homework that they're doing online? All of these things are 
negotiations. How do you do it mindfully? How are you aware of all the things that are negotiable? So given that negotiation is a muscle that can be improved, given that we negotiate every day in a personal and in a professional way, and then in these unprecedented times, they've converged in a way that we've never seen before, it's worth an hour out of our day to figure out how to do it better. So, how well are you negotiating? When you look at the conversations that you've had recently, whether they are with colleagues, with partners, with children, how well are you negotiating? And if you're thinking, eh, not that great, then I wanna ask you yet another question. How do you view negotiations? Do you view negotiations as a competition, meaning something that I need to win at all costs? Any conversation that I enter into, if we are trying to figure out who gets more of something, I view negotiations as a fixed pie, and my goal is to win. Is that your viewpoint of negotiations? Or do you have the mindset of, ah, negotiations are so stressful, I don't even want to think about it. Here, you just take it. Our view of negotiations very much influences how well we negotiate. The conversations with your colleagues, with your boss, with your partner, with your children are very much informed by, and the approach and its strategies that we use are very much infused by how you view negotiations. I'd like to offer you an organizing approach to help either, if you view negotiation as something that's very intimidating, will help to lower the anxiety. If you view negotiation as something that I try to win at all costs, I'd like to offer an approach that will help you to expand your viewpoint of the definition of negotiation, what's possible in negotiation, and the ability to create doable and durable agreements, which generally only happen when both sides feel that their needs have been met. So what is this unifying or overarching approach to negotiations that I'd like to introduce you to? Your approach, the strategies that you use, the techniques that you employ, the understanding that you're trying to reach for all negotiations should always funnel through three key questions. And those are, how important is the outcome? What are your long-term goals? And how important is the relationship? Given what, uh, which of these three questions is the foremost in your mind very much dictates the strategies and approaches that it makes sense to use within a negotiation. Now, it just so happens that these three questions nicely fall into the two main approaches that I'm going to introduce you to. First, I wanna give you a little more of an intro of why these questions are so important. How important is the relationship? If the relationship is the most important thing to you, then a scorched earth getting the most resources is not over a long term going to build up the necessary elements to sustain that relationship. What are your long term goals? If you have something that will take a long time to achieve, it may make strategic sense to, you know what? to ensure goodwill, to position myself favorably within the organization or within my home, I will let this one go. How important is the outcome? If this is a one-time event, for example, you're buying a car and the relationship with the car dealer is not on the foremost edges of your mind, you're not necessarily looking for a 
holiday card for him in December. If your long-term goals in that you don't plan on buying every single car from this car dealership, if the outcome of paying as little as possible for the best type of car that you can get is important to you, then there are specific strategies and approaches that make sense there. If the relationship, the relationship of making sure that your kids feel nurtured, protected is important to you, that also calls for a very different set of negotiation skills. So as we think about the approach to negotiations, what I want to stress here is that it's so much more than pulling out a book and learning a bunch of strategies. Those strategies aren't suited for all circumstances or for every personality. It's my hope that over the next 45 minutes, I can give you a set of tools and given what your personality is, given which of these questions is the most important to you, that you will have approaches and techniques that you can use to help you create doable and durable agreements. All right, so let's start looking at some basic negotiation frameworks. The first that I'd like to talk about is the distributive approach to negotiation. Now, when we talk distributive, of those three questions, what is triggered or most suitable for distributive negotiation approaches? And that would be, how important is the outcome? If the outcome is to, going back to the used car example, to pay as little as possible for the car, I would recommend a set of distributive approaches and techniques. Ah, we have a question. Yes. Yes. Do you view the apparent tension between concerns over public health and the health of the economy as something that can be effectively negotiated? Hannah asked a very interesting question. Given the times that we have right now, do I see the tensions in let's open the economy as quickly as possible and the public health concerns that are raised by perhaps going in too soon? Is that something that can be negotiated and reconciled? And yes. In fact, I'd like to look at it through the lens of the three questions. What, how important is the outcome? The outcome is making sure that we have healthy people who can engage in the economy, in the work world. The long-term goals, again, is to prevent a reoccurrence of the virus in the fall. And the relationship between the government as being seen as someone who should trust and use resources to help the people, very important. So. When we look at this, what types of strategies are important? And one that's very important is what are the underlying interests? Oftentimes in negotiations, people get very mired down in the position. And some of the positions that I've heard is we want to get back to work as soon as possible. And if you engage someone on the position level, People have a tendency to hunker down. I have a right to work. I'm not making any money. And as long as you engage them at the position level, you will get a lot of resistance. In the beginning, I said that effective negotiation is also negotiation strategies aimed at understanding. What is important about going back to work? What does that allow you to do? What are the interests that, because in my opinion, I want to go back to work as the tip of the iceberg. That is your position. What are the interests that make up wanting to go back to work? I don't have resources. I don't have access to these things. For us to engage in negotiations, I encourage people to look at how can I help the other side meet those interests? When you meet the interests, people's death grip on their 
position begins to lessen. And to a certain extent, we saw the government do this. When they sent out the stimulus check, the thought was, if we can allay people's financial concerns, they will be more inclined to wait out until the, it is safe to go back. So when we look at situations, I encourage people to strive for understanding, to look beneath the position of, I've got to go back to work. Ask questions. Why is going back to work important? And then you learn about I financial concerns. You may, I'm worried about job security. I'm worried about paying the mortgage. When you begin to look at the interests that make up that position, I think of each of those pieces of information, each of their interests as a Lego piece. And the more pieces of Lego I get on the table, the better agreement I can build. If I can structure the conversation such that I can meet those underlying issues, I can get people to move off of or create space where both of our interests can be met. I'd like to jump back to distributive negotiation. In distributive negotiation, we have a tendency to think of an issue as a fixed pie. And our goal is to divvy up pieces. The more pieces I get, the more I win. The fewer pieces you get, the more I win again. The difficulty with taking a distributive approach is that it may strain the relationship. So going back to those three questions, if the outcome, paying as little as possible for the car, is the most important thing, I will use strategies and approaches that help me anchor at a price that's acceptable to me. And I will try to get you to meet my price. However, those strategies, those approaches, seldom engender a feeling of rapport or a desire for a long-term relationship. Now, in the popular press, sometimes distributive negotiation gets a bad rap. However, if it is a one-time event, buying a car, buying a dishwasher, distributive strategies and approaches where you look at claiming the maximum value may make sense. And there are a myriad of approaches that I would love to get into and will in the four-part course where we look at specific distributive strategies to help you anchor at a price that's acceptable to you and through a series of questions and approaches, get the other side to move toward your anchored price. However, the downside of distributive negotiation is that those strategies and approaches in a long-term relationship has a tendency to deteriorate the, the relationship or may strain the relationship. So what are those other situations where the focus may be on a long-term goal or on a relationship? In situations like that, I encourage people to not think of it as a fixed pie, but rather to think of it as a situation where through understanding, we increase what is possible for both sides. Again, at the end of the day, the goal of all negotiations is to create doable and durable agreements. If people feel that they've been raked over the coal, the possibility of a sustained long-term agreement or relationship diminishes. So in integrative negotiations, we will look at strategies and approaches for meeting the interests, the why. We go below the tip of the iceberg. Why is getting back to work so important to you? Can I meet some of those needs? Can I allay some of those anxieties in a way that still keeps you in a safe space, meaning sheltering in place? When you do that, when you meet people's interests, you have the ability to sustain the relationship. An overly simplistic 
view. If you have children and you are trying to get them to eat all of their vegetables, you can take a very distributive approach, meaning you will eat all the vegetables on your plate. And that would be that the outcome of a plate free of vegetables is your goal. You can use power, force, coercion, bribery to get what you want. And at the end of the day, you can always hold out the card of, I'm the parent, do what I say. Now, you may win. And in a distributive sense, you have achieved the goal, but you may have strained the relationship. So in an integrative approach to the vegetable scenario, how can you create meaning for both sides while enhancing or sustaining the relationship? So if you go back to those three questions and your long-term goal is to have a positive relationship with your children, both now and in the future, how can you create a situation where both sides feel that they've won? I will leave that in terms of successful ways to get children to eat their vegetables up to you. And if you have any really good suggestions, feel free to share them with me. What I wanna spend a little bit of time on is the framework. When you approach a negotiation, first, take a look at the three questions. How important is the outcome? What are your long-term goals? How important is the relationship? And then plan. In the beginning, I said that oftentimes negotiations can occur reflexively. You are drawn into a negotiation without giving much more thought to it other than what your position is. I want to do this or I don't want to do that. I encourage you to take a different approach. First, what do you want from the situation? Meaning from the relationship, for yourself, for the other party. Oftentimes in negotiations, we have a tendency to be very focused on what is it that I need out of this situation? Doable and durable agreements are born out of both sides having some of their needs met. So prioritize. What's the most important thing? Is it the outcome? Is it a long-term goal? Is it the relationship? And then begin to plan. But when you plan, I encourage you to think of what's important to you, but to also step into the shoes of the other party. What's important for them? How do you prioritize all of the competing interests? So, I've mentioned the position. And when I talk about position is, what do you want? What will you do? What won't you do for whatever the goal of the relationship is? The position part is very clear. The tougher part is the interests. Why do you want what you want? And the important thing in the planning and the prioritization phase is, you go through this exercise, not just for you, but for the other side. Step into the shoes of the other party. They will be very forthcoming about what it is they want, their position. But why? Why do they want what they want? And through skillful questioning, through active listening, you can hear, and are there ways that you can meet those interests, those needs. And if you can, the tenacious grip on someone's position begins to lessen. If I were to ask you what is one of the most common negotiations, people tend have a tendency to say compensation or salary negotiations. And it's usually thought of more salary negotiations than compensation. And people are usually very fixated on what the number is, and that is their position. I need to make X amount and I won't take a penny less. That dollar figure is important because of what it allows you to do. When we talk about 
compensation, I encourage people to think of what are ways or how can you get those underlying interests met? Money is only important insofar as it allows you to do things. So when you negotiate, think expansively. Are there ways that you can get those needs met? If making a certain amount of money is important because your car insurance is expensive, is there a way that your employer could either subsidize your training or your transportation? Is there the Baltimore circulator? These types of things open up possibility and allows you to explore other permutations or alternatives to getting your needs met. So as you plan for negotiations, it's imperative that you're clear on what your position is. And that's the easy part. But why is it that you want what you want? And more importantly, when you go into negotiations, ask the other side the important questions of why that position might be important to them. Because in explaining it, that is when they begin to share with you the area that allows for effective negotiation and agreement, the why they want what they want. Okay, so plan. And in planning, what are the immediate obstacles for whatever your goal is? And I encourage you to think through what are options to overcome them, both from your point of view and from the other point of view. What are questions or challenges that would readily be brought up from the other side? And when you make your request or your ask, is it framed in a way that rents space in their brain? Meaning, is it framed in a way that allows them to engage and invites them into an agreement environment with you? So I'd like to give you a little example to begin to walk you through some of the terms in the planning and the position phase that I've talked about. Oftentimes, we are again so mired down in our position and that is what people react to. An example that doesn't always put me in the best light, I am not a great driver. In fact, I have a tendency to hit things. And sometimes I have to teach in DC, which requires me to commute about 45 minutes. When I found my teaching schedule that I had to work in D.C., I was complaining to my husband, wow, I don't want to work in D.C. And his response to me was, huh, you have to work in D.C., which made me annoyed. So I took on the position, you know, I cook all the time. When I come home, I want dinner on the table. And that was my position. Now, when I came home from work, the lights in the kitchen were dimmed. I went over to where I sit and there was a pizza box and grease had soaked through the lid of the pizza box. And when I opened it up, there was one piece of pizza, anchovy, which I hate, left. My husband met my position. I said I wanted dinner on the table and I got dinner on the table. Oftentimes when you engage at the positional level, the response of the other side, either one is an antagonistic engagement or the lack of insightful questioning and interaction that can lead to a doable and durable agreement. In that situation, was it about dinner on the table? Absolutely not. What it was, was I knew that I had to drive home from DC in probably bad weather because it was the month of February and I was really nervous about it. And the idea that he got to sit home in the quiet with the beer hanging out just didn't seem fair to me. When I came home the next night from teaching in DC, there's a glass of wine on the table. 
what that said to me was my husband saying, Stace, I know the drive was tough. I appreciate that. The interests. In negotiations, it is critical that we go beneath the idea of positions. Me saying I wanted dinner on the table, which in reality wasn't what the negotiation was about at all. It was, I wanted to feel appreciated. When you look at the negotiations in your life, to what extent are you engaging at the positional level? If you look at some of the animosity in Congress, if you look at what's going on right now, people are very much engaging at the position level of reacting to the outward statement of, I don't want to compromise. I don't want to. I want to be able to go to work. Effective negotiation and effective negotiators take the time to plan and prioritize by asking insightful questions. Why are these things important? What are the interests of the other party? And if I look at those interests, how can I meet them? So when you begin to anticipate obstacles that may be raised by the other side because you've taken the time to step into their shoes. What's important to them? What are obstacles that they are facing in getting those objectives met? What are the ops? Ah, yes. Professor, we have a question. What are some of the best ways to open a conversation in which you plan to have a negotiation? Ah, what Jesse asked a great question. What are some of the ways to open a conversation in which you plan to have a negotiation? I like to think of one of the most effective ways of asking, of opening a negotiation is how can you frame it to rent space in someone else's brain? Here's what I mean by that. If you've ever had the opportunity to watch an old Peanuts or Snoopy example, whenever there is a parent on the phone you just hear wah, 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 which means I am not actively engaged in what you have to say. When I'm going to enter into a negotiation, there are several things that are very important. First, people want to feel heard and understood. So I'm going to open the conversation by first stating my intention of, I'd like to discuss X, and I believe we can come to a beneficial solution where we both gain something. That lets them know, rather than the distributive point of view of I win, you lose, that I'm open and I'm aware that a negotiation is a dialogue and an interaction. And then, depending on the nature of the negotiation, and this borrows a lot from the conflict research, I'm going to ask them what their viewpoint is. What do you think about X? And then I'm going to listen. And as I listen to whatever they're discussing, from then, I'm going to share my viewpoint and invite them into a conversation where we create a third reality. So in negotiations, it's important to state your positive intention. It is important to establish trust early on. And you can establish trust in negotiations oftentimes by offering a piece of information that you didn't have to. By sharing a piece of information that invites the other person to reciprocate. It lets the other person know that you're open. If you go into a negotiation very closed, you will typically get that reaction or that affect mirrored back from you. It's very interesting, and I tell students this, because negotiations start out the same way as an instructor's first class session. It's during the first five minutes of a negotiation or a class session that you have the other side's utmost attention. At that point, they are making determinations. Is this person trustworthy? Are they worth engaging? What can I get out of this situation? It is during that time that I try to set the stage. I'm trustworthy. I'm open. I want to listen to what you have to say to establish my trustworthiness and my openness. Again, I am open to making a small concession of giving them something 
without asking, hoping that they will respond in kind. From there, you've set a basic level of trust and interaction that you can build on over the course of the negotiation. Also, in the beginning of negotiations, I'm loath to interrupt. People want to feel heard and understood. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions and I'm going to listen thoughtfully to your responses. Oftentimes when we start negotiations, we be, enter in with the mindset of, I've got to convince the other side how right I am. And then people have a tendency to verbally vomit on the other side. The research shows that skillful negotiators ask twice as many questions as non-skillful negotiators. For me to find out what your interests are, so I can figure out if there's another way to meet them, I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to frame my asks or what's important to me in a way that will resonate with you. Professor, we have a couple questions. Sure. So the first question is from Martha and she says, could you talk about the principle of fairness in the process of negotiating? How central of an idea is it? Fairness should be the cornerstone of negotiations and it's important on two different levels. It's important on the first level of when you step into the shoes of the other side. I always encourage people to be mindful of the fact that there is a five-year-old inside of each one of us. When you were five, it was often that the refrain for something being imposed on you would be, that's not fair. And as we mature, we get a little more oh, politically correct about the term, but the idea of fairness never leaves us. So a fair process, I think, is integral to a doable and durable agreement. Not a big sports fan, which is good because no one's watching sports right now. However, football games are started with a flip of a coin. You may not like the results, but everyone buys that the process itself of flipping the coin to figure out who's going to be the receiving team is fair. So when I enter into negotiations, I'm very mindful. What are processes and data that I can share with the other side that both of us would interpret as fair. I'm an attorney, whether I'm on the plaintiff or the defense side, we both, both sides accept the idea that the law itself is a fair process. So as you prepare for negotiations, what processes, what procedures can ensure, what data can help ensure fairness in the process? And what can we learn from negotiations that happen outside of business? Uh, the Good Friday Agreement, peace between British and the Irish government in the late 1990s. There is so much that you can learn from negotiations outside the business world. And actually, I teach a course in healthcare negotiations. And I do that because it is not uncommon in business schools or in the popular press for the negotiation strategies that are used to be very business oriented. In healthcare in particular, profit does not drive the majority of the conduct. More importantly, what I found are the people who provide care have a very different mindset. When the quality measures will make the difference between someone living or dying, when the need to make sure that a patient doesn't code out on the table, it requires a set of negotiation skills that are far more nuanced. And the people that are drawn to the healthcare industry are ones that are and what's happening now is an excellent example, are far more inclined to take on risks to their own health to provide care for people. So given that mindset, given that what is at stake is not a bottom line, but someone's life, 
what type of negotiation skills are required when you're dealing with patients' families, when you're dealing with patients, when you're negotiating on behalf of a patient with an insurer, when you're negotiating with the government or regulatory agencies. Because what's at stake is so very different than what you see in the traditional business world, it requires an entirely different set of skills or a more nuanced set of skills. And before I mentioned a toolbox, the toolbox and skills that I use, whether they are hardball tactics or very integrative tactics, whether they are ones that you would adopt or not, the importance of delving deeper into negotiations is very much grounded in the fact that whether a particular strategy is one that you would use isn't as important as what do you do when it is used against you? How can you deflect? How can you pivot or turn the situation so that you can stay true to who you are, but also obtain your objective? So I feel that I did not give you specific strategies and approaches, mainly because that requires a bit more time than what we have, but there's a host of literature out there. And I do have several strategies and can make resources available that look at how particular industries outside of the business world have to finesse or nuance or that certain mindsets require a different type of negotiation skills than are traditionally espoused in the business negotiation literature. So we have another question. Yes. So this is from an anonymous user. And the question is, does research show gender bias is still a factor in negotiation outcomes? If so, what are strategies to address this? Uh, yes. Gender, generational, and culture are three things that very much influence negotiation strategies. I will not for one second say that some of the things in the business literature in terms of negotiation strategies are tips or strategies that I can employ. And without getting into a long conversation of gender inequities, there are strategies that when used by males, very effective. When used by females, not as effective. The research shows that men and women are more aggressive or are harder in negotiating with other females. So men will negotiate more aggressively with another female and women negotiate more aggressively with other females. The research also shows that when women are, for lack of a better term, aggressive in negotiating, that both men and women like them less. So yes, it is very much a role. And the approach to negotiation very much is a linguistic approach that begins as soon as you wrap an infant in a pink or a blue blanket. And the business world in particular has a vocabulary that is very male centered. And when women enter into that environment and use things such as apologies, such as using more plural pronoun for we did this, we did a great job, rather than the individual male centered, and this is overgeneralizing over point of view, that very much affects the value that they can claim in a negotiation and how successful they are in negotiating. So it is incredibly nuanced and it is a real challenge, both on a gender, a generational and a cultural level. So people need to be very aware of not only how they perceive themselves, but how society could potentially perceive them in using specific negotiation strategies and approaches. We have another question. Um, yes. The question is, 
It sounds like mindset is critical in the art of negotiation. Can you briefly speak to growth mindset versus fixed mindsets and how both can impact the outcome? Yes, fixed mindset. If you go into a negotiation with the idea that I am right and I'm going to convince you to give me what I need, the ability for creating doable and durable agreements is very small. A growth mindset, which I'm interpreting here is I'm going in with an open mind. My goal is the strategy of understanding. I'd like to understand what your interests, delving beneath the position, what your interests are, what my interests are, and then sorting those interests. There will be some compatible interests. If we want the both, if we both want the same thing, how can I effectively use that to establish trust, to build rapport? If we have different interests, that's great. Different interests allow me, moving outside of the fixed mindset, to create an environment where this is important to me, this is important to you. How might we either trade or combine or leverage those different interests to help us both create a win-win situation? And then there are merely interests that are in conflict. And again, with a fixed mindset, I'm going into it as my position must prevail. In a growth mindset, I'm very much interested in why is that position important to you? Are there interests that make up that position that I might be able to meet? It is only in delving beneath the position view that you begin to have the leverage to make an agreement. Me demanding dinner on the table, the only outcome was either you get dinner or you don't. Why was dinner on the table important to me? Driving stressful, I'd like a way to unwind and relax. I'd like to know that you were thinking of me as I was white knuckling it down 95 to get home. That allows someone to work with something. That growth mindset invites the other person into an exploration of what those interests are and how to meet them. If there are no more questions, I'd like to spend just a few minutes, and we have about 10 minutes or so left, thinking about, again, our approach to negotiations. And this somewhat relates back to the mindset. How do you think of negotiations? Do you go into it as this is a formal setting where I'm given a menu of options? I can have A, B, or C. So when you approach negotiations, do you order something on the menu? Do you look around to see what other people are getting? Or do you ask for something off the menu? Here's what I mean by that. Oftentimes, we don't think expansively. We believe that we are given an option. I can go with A or B. And both are stated as positions. And that's a very fixed mindset. In Integrative negotiations, I encourage you to order off the menu, to think creatively about what are ways that both sides' needs can be met. But they can only be met if I know those needs, and those needs almost always lie beneath the positional level. How am I asking questions? How am I getting information from the other side about what interests them. It's interesting, when you walk into a restaurant, the only, you never have complete knowledge, but what you're pretty sure of is, yeah, I'm pretty hungry. So your goal is to find out information about the other side. What's on the menu? What are the specials? What do you recommend? In negotiations, there will be a number of unknowns, but what you do know the most about is yourself. So allow airtime for finding out about the other side. What are their hopes? What are their dreams? Why is this deal important to them? How will they feel if we don't reach agreement? 
Are there other opportunities available to them? That type of information allows you to better sort and possibly connect what your interests are and what their interests are. And that's how you really succeed, again, in creating those doable and durable agreement situations. So, what I like to think of as some golden rules in negotiation. Negotiate for yourself as you would for others. And circling back to the comment that was raised about gender, the research says that in traditional negotiations, women oftentimes do not, when they are negotiating, when women are negotiating on behalf of themselves, they do not reap as many gains as men do. However, when women are negotiating on behalf of someone else, their gains in negotiations are equal or oftentimes exceed that of their male counterparts. So in speaking to the females, but I think that this is something that makes sense for everyone, that makes a ton of sense. When we think about preparing for negotiations and prioritizing what's important to us, the mindset that we go into it is very important. If it helps you, think about how would I negotiate on behalf of someone else? If I feel insecure about asking for something for myself, oftentimes thinking, yes, but I could be a zealous advocate for someone else, step into their shoes. For negotiations, a lot of it is preparation. Now, when I say preparation, I don't recommend waiting until you're having that all important compensation negotiation to try out negotiation strategies and approaches. Start small. It is the practice of negotiation time and time again that gives you the comfort level and the sense of confidence to negotiate the bigger things. So how do you practice? We have a few minutes, so I will share a story with you. There are two ways that I like to practice. One is, and if you live in Baltimore City, this may resonate with you, Comcast is our cable carrier. And there's no other service provider out here, so there isn't a ton of competition. Every six months, I practice my negotiation skills by calling and asking to their, Comcast is gonna hate the inflow of calls that they get after this, their retention manager. How can I begin in a low stakes way to practice asking for what I want, asking questions to understand what their position is? They're usually running a special and I'll, can I have that special? They'll say, no, you're not a new customer. But again, by asking, by practicing in low stakes situations, you begin to strengthen that negotiations muscle so that when you're having tougher conversations. You're better at it. But also it does something a little more. By looking for situations to negotiate, you raise your level of awareness for what is negotiable. Once we're no longer quarantined, when you are staying at home, when you walk into a restaurant, can I sit there rather than over there? Low stakes negotiation. But think of it as, yes, this is something that is negotiable. You get better at negotiating by practicing. You can practice more when you've raised your level of awareness of what is negotiable, and most things are. The second opportunity is when I go into Lowe's. And to be fair, my husband will not go into Lowe's or Home Depot with me. But if you're aware, both Lowe's and Home Depot offer a 10% discount if you're a veteran or if you're a senior citizen. I've gone to practice my negotiation skills of, hey, can I have that 10% discount? Whether I fit into the category or not, do I get shot down? Eh, more often than not. But again, thinking of what is negotiable, of practicing, of practicing with people. 
during the four part course, we will spend the majority of the time debriefing negotiations. All of the strategies in the world on paper are not as effective as making you a better negotiator than trying it on your own. And then having the opportunity with someone who's had that same shared experience to debrief what went well, what would you like to work on? How did you feel? How good were you at asking questions? And when you get into the planning for negotiations, if you go in with an idea of these are the things that I'd like to accomplish at the end of the negotiation, how'd you do? Professor, we have another question. Yes. And this question says, how can you prepare yourself for a negotiation with someone who has a stance for which you are morally opposed? How can you, for a stance that you are morally opposed? That's a tough one. And I need to know a little bit more about how morally opposed I am. But in negotiations, I like to think of something called the ERP model, and that's interest, rights, and power. The stance that I'm morally opposed to, I would try to focus on the interests of the negotiation. What is going on? Can I appeal to factual issues? Can I, rather than couching this in terms of right and wrong, when you begin to enter into value-laden words, that can be a minefield for negotiations. So when I enter into negotiations with someone that I may not be on the same footing in terms of our view of what is moral or what is right, I try to appeal to what are the interests that can be achieved here, because that allows us to have a more dispassionate view. Quick example, though I'm not horribly morally opposed to this, of the ERP model. Uh, let's say you have some kids and it's time for them to take a bath. You can go at the interest level. You guys are dirty, you have sunscreen on, you uh, have bug spray on. It is in your interests to take a shower, to get the sand from the beach, all that off of you. What typically happens is, and going back to the question that we have on fairness, people go outside of interests into rights. And when I talk about rights, I'm talking about those value laden words. And you may hear something like, hey, that's not fair. You and dad don't have to take a bath at eight o'clock. You're being unreasonable. You're being unfair. You're being mean. The worst thing that you can do is to follow someone out into a conversation with value laden fairness. You're not right. You're not just. People have a extreme resistance because then your criticism then becomes, you're saying I'm not a just person. You're saying I'm not a morally ethical person. And in a negotiation to get me to change my view of myself is something that you're going to have an extreme amount of difficulty to getting me to do. So keep it on interest because what typically happens is after the fairness conversation, of, oh, that's not right. Then people have a tendency to go to power. Meaning I'll listen to my kid complain for about five or 10 minutes about how it's not fair or right that they have to take a bath. And then I'm gonna say, I'm the mom, get in the tub. While I have forced the result, a doable and durable agreement may work as long as the kid is five, but it's not going to work over the long term. So when you are dealing with morally charged issues, what are the interests that you can point to that are less infused with value statements of right, of just, of fair? Because when you do that, you're not only taking on whatever the issue is at hand, you are on a level challenging their self-identity and the ability to get someone in anger to change that is going to be virtually impossible. So very much stick to interests 
And in the planning phase, I would encourage you to what are the interests that they would have in reaching agreement or allowing me access to or wins in certain areas. If there are no other questions, I do believe that we are out of time. I've enjoyed the questions and I look forward to the opportunity to interact with you guys again.